If you have your Bibles, I invite you to get them now and turn them to Romans. Turn your Bible to Romans chapter 16. As we read the last verses of this last chapter, Romans chapter 16 from verse 25 to 27. And if you are able to stand, please let us stand to honor God in the reading of His Word. Romans 16, starting on verse 25. Now to Him who is able to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now has been made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures has been made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Let us pray. Indeed, our Father God, we give you all the glory through Christ Jesus. Because it is you and only you, the wise God, the eternal God and the all-powerful God, who not only created all things, made us to your image. And though that image was ruined, destroyed because of sin, yet you've made a way for us to be saved from sin. And that is through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And so as we've read your word, may your Holy Spirit now teach us as we present to you ourselves, our hearts, our minds, open the ears of our understanding. And may your Holy Spirit not only enable us to receive your words with gladness, but empower us to live this life the life that you have given us for the glory and honor of your name, for you are worthy. This we pray. Amen. You may all be seated. Our message title for today, if I may just uh, I forgot to uh, mirror it, so there it is. The message for today is doxology. A very fitting title because that's exactly what we just read in this last chapter and the last verses of this magnificent book. A book that is considered the greatest book of the Bible. Definitely of the New Testament. And for sure, of all the writings of Paul. The book of Romans. We're now in conclusion. It is considered, as we've said, the greatest book. Because in this book, we learn the wisdom of God, the power of God, even the love of God in saving the sinner from condemnation of sin. How? By justification sanctification, and even glorification all through faith in Jesus Christ. God, who is absolutely holy and pure, made a way for sinful man, sinful man who is separated from God because of sin, to be brought back to God, as in reconciled to God, as in having peace with God. Because sinners, there was an enmity between sinful man and God. Not just separation, but hostility, rebellion. But because of Jesus Christ, sinners by faith can be justified and reconciled and have peace with God. And we see that in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, where it says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, would men and sinners understand this? 
that there is no way for anyone to be reconciled to God except through faith in Jesus Christ. Not by any religious, sincere good works, but only through Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. In verse 10, it says, For, for if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? And so we studied this book of Romans a few years ago and went through it from chapter 1 to chapter 16. I don't know if you remember that. But if you have forgotten, here's the summary of this book. In chapters 1 to 3, we see the holiness of God as He condemned sin and sinners. And if you haven't read the book of Romans, that is what I would recommend you to read. And that's what we see in chapters 1 and 3, the holiness of God as He condemns sin and sinners. That's the holiness of God. But then in chapters 3 and 4, in the beginning of chapter 5, we see the mercy and the grace and the love of God in justifying sinners by faith in Christ. In chapter 6 to 8, we see the power of God in sanctifying the believer and follower of Christ by the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, and giving us even the hope of glorification when Christ returns. And then in chapters 9 to 11, we see the wisdom and sovereignty of God in saving both the Jews and the Gentiles. Not just one particular group of people, but all that believe in Christ, believe in their heart. And then in chapter 12, where we started this mini-series, we learned a proper and reasonable response to all of God's goodness, all the mercies of God in Christ Jesus from chapter 1 to chapter 11. And that reasonable response is to live a life of worship by presenting or offering or giving our bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. That's in chapter 1, I mean chapter 12, verse 1. But not only that, we also learned how, how that looks like or how it applies in our personal life, including our family life, in our social life that is relating with other people in society, and also in our civic life as citizens in this world. And for the bulk of our series, how it applies in our church life, our church family, in our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And going through each lesson in this past Sunday, some of you might have gotten the sense of difficulty, the, the tall demand in applying this response of giving our lives a living sacrifice and living a life of worship unto the Lord in the different areas of our lives that were mentioned, but particularly in our church life. And it is difficult. None of this is easy. But that is precisely what it's, why it's called sacrifice. A living sacrifice. We've gotten used in this comfortable America and the mindset of the American dream that life of comfort and happiness is what Christianity is about in this world. That is in eternity. But here in this world, life in Christ and following Christ is not about comfort, personal comfort and happiness. It's about living, following, serving the one who loved us enough and gave his son for us. Jesus Christ, who did not live a comfortable life here on earth. And even in this last day, before the crucifixion, He was brutally whipped and, and flogged and made to carry a cross on His shoulder all the way to Calvary. And you could hear not a single word of complaint in the Lord. And remember what the Bible says, Jesus said, if any one of you wants to follow me, follow me. Follow me. 
And if the Lord went through all these things and suffered all these things, who are you and I not to experience those things? But you see, that's not the American concept of Christianity. The free Western world. It's all about ease and comfort. But that's why it's called sacrifice. And what is the worth of our worship to God or our service to God if there is no sacrifice, if it doesn't cost us anything? As Jesus said, you must deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow me. So our reasonable response to God's mercies is a living sacrifice. But thank God we don't have to do this in our own strength. Otherwise, not only will we all fall constantly, but we will give up completely. It's easy to give up. But we thank God that God is not only with us, but in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit, who comforts and encourages us and enables us to continue to be faithful. So listen. We need to remember that as God calls us to this life and give us His word to follow, He also is the God who enables us to do what He has given us to do. And that's why we give Him all the glory. We give Him the praise and thanksgiving for who He is and for all the great things He has done. And that's what we have in our text, a doxology. After going through this book about all who God is and all God has done in saving us sinners and then te teaching us what life in Christ looks like, the Apostle Paul appropriately and properly gives God a doxology. What does doxology mean? Well, doxa, not doxend, okay? Doxo, which means praise or glory. Logia, which means word or expression. So doxology is a word or expression of praise or glory. And again, this is what we have in our text. Paul giving God a word of praise, giving God the glory, and gives us even the reason as to why we ought to give God the glory. Look at verse 25 in our text. Now to him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. It begins with these wonderful words. Now to him, and that is God, to him who is able. Listen, our God is able. This able is in reference to his power. Our God is powerful. As a matter of fact, the Bible declares all powerful. And frankly, that is all what God needs to be. That's all that God needs to be God. Power. And having all the power for that matter. But thank God it's not just all powerful. We know the other attributes of God so that He is, you know, that he's not just all-powerful so that he is ruthless, tyrant. No, God is holy. He's not evil. God is righteous, not wicked. God is love. He's the God who did and does what is good and pleasing and perfect. He's the God of wonders. And that's where we see also his awesome power. The God who created the heavens and the earth and spoke it into existence just by the power of His Word. His Word. Not only is He the God of creation who created all good things, He is the God who sustains everything. He sustains everything. How? Also by the power of His Word. His Word. And we can see the summation of this truth in Christ Jesus, who is the Word of God in person or personified. That's in Colossians chapter, chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, where it says, He, in reference to Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. That is Jesus Christ. And in John chapter 1, remember in verse 1 to 3, where it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And who is this Word of God? Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That is Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Of course, God has many children through faith in Christ, sons and daughters, but God has only one begotten Son that came from the very heart, the very bosom of the Father. And this is our God. Our God is able, the Almighty, who is mighty to save, that is to save us from the impossible situation of sin. Have we forgotten the impossible situation of sin? Sometimes we have forgotten that, so that with so many times, we, we can just go to church with that attitude well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a saved, and we have forgotten where we've come from. We've come from a situation where we were condemned because of sin. And so, again, the power of God who's able to save us from the impossible situations of sin, that is the power of God. He is able to do not only what is difficult, but what is impossible. And that's why the Bible declares that nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you have a situation right now? A problem, an issue, personally, health-wise, relationship, job, whatever it is. And for you, it's difficult, and perhaps you've said it's impossible. Well, it is in our own strength and way, but with God, nothing is too difficult, nothing even is impossible. He is able to do what is impossible for us, which is basically salvation from sin. Why is it impossible for us to save, to, to save ourselves? Number one, God is holy and His, His, His holiness and His glory is perfect. It's absolute. While we, we all have sinned. And not only have we sinned, the Bible said what? We all fall short of the glory of God. And that is in Romans 3.23. We've read it so many times. And also in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, lest we have forgotten this, in Romans chapter 3, verse 10 to 12, what does it say? As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And that is in God's eyes. Don't ever forget that that's where we came from. We were not good, even though you may have gone to church all your life. You were not good, you were not righteous, even though you may have been sincere in doing what is good. We were conceived in sin, every single one of us. Only Jesus was immaculately conceived. But the rest of us, we were all conceived in sin. Born in sin. And because of our sin, we were separated from God. That's Romans 6, 23, where the wages of sin is what? Separation. That's death. And there is no way that we as sinners can pay for our sins and be accepted by holy God. 
Because if we want to pay for our sins, that means we will have to be separated from God for how? For, for how long? For all eternity in hell. There was no way for us to get ourselves out from that condition. That is, by ourselves, with men, there is no way. It is impossible, but not with God. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 26 to 27, when His disciples asked Him, how can men be saved? It says there in Mark 10, 26, and they, that is the disciples, were exceedingly astonished and said to Him, that is to Jesus, then who can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. God made a way, as we have just sung. And that way is His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who said, Jesus who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. But back to our text in verse 25. To Him who is able, remember that God is able. Able to do what? To establish us, that is the church, that is you and me and every believer in Christ. God who is able, meaning powerful to save us, is also able, meaning powerful, to strengthen us, to sustain us, to establish us. In the text, that's what it says, to establish you. The word establish has to do with the idea of, first of all, to found, as in to bring into existence. Just like establishing an entity or corporation that is represented in an establishment or a building that is founded or brought about on a foundation. And a building have been being founded, is built and established, strengthened and sustained. So using that as an illustration, the church is founded that is brought into existing by the power of God. And the church that is founded is also built, strengthened and sustained Made firm, stabilized, established. And that's why we give God glory. Because He is the God who is able to save us, but not only to save us, but to establish us, His church. He is our strength, not only individually, but even as a church. How? Well, Paul says, by my gospel. Paul says, my gospel not that it's from Him or that He made it up. He is not saying that He invented or produced the gospel. He says, my gospel, because it is the only gospel or message He preaches or proclaims as He received it directly from God. And we read that in Galatians chapter 1, verse 11 to 12, where Paul says to the Galatian church, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. That is the true and pure gospel. And we have emphasized that last week because even today, just like in the early days of the church, there are so-called ministers who are preaching the false gospel. And that's what Galatians is about. The Jewish, so-called Jewish Christians who went to the Gentile churches and saying to the Gentile Christians, in order for you to be truly Christians or be in the kingdom of God, not only do you need to believe in Jesus Christ, but you need to be Jewish. You need to become a Jew by going to the ritual of circumcision and following the Mosaic law. And that's today what's happening. Not the Jews going to the Gentiles, but ministers in the guise of being ministers of Christ and saying to people, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you also need to, and then they add whatever requirement they add. Whether it is baptism in the water or, or, or uh, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or following church rules. These are all good, but it is never a requirement for salvation. And so, this gospel that Paul preaches 
is the gospel that is directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that He has given us this blessing of knowing Him by faith, by His grace, receiving the power not only of salvation, but also to be established. That is, you and I, not only as individuals, but more so as a church, we are established, meaning founded and strengthened by the power of God in the gospel. The gospel, remember, is the power of God for salvation. There is no other way for man to be saved from sin but by the gospel message. Remember, the gospel is the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus. The message or the gospel or good news is Jesus Christ, the Savior who saved us from sin. The gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, as Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So everyone who believes, everyone who has faith, in other words, a person needs to believe to have faith in order to be saved. And that is why we need to hear the gospel message, the message of the Word of God, because that's how faith comes according to Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So back in our text, now to Him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, God is able not only to save you, but to establish you by the gospel, which is again, God's word. So listen, do you want to be strengthened in your life as a Christian? Do you want to have power to live the Christian life? Do you want to be thoroughly equipped to live life in godliness in this dark world? Do you want to have victory in the struggles that you go through in life? Individually, personally, if you're married in your married life, if you have children in, in your family life, do you want to be thoroughly equipped to live life in godliness? Do you want to have faith? Uh, do, you, do you want your faith to grow strong and be able to trust the Lord and follow Him faithfully in these perilous times? Then listen, go to the Word of God. Like a newborn baby, the Bible says, crave and desire the pure milk of the Word. That's 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. Crave it. Are you craving for the Word of God? Do you desire the Word of God? Desire it like a newborn baby. And let the Word of Christ, Colossians 3.16, let, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it fill not only your mind, but your heart. Lessen your exposure to social media and filling yourself with all this garbage. Fill your life with the Word of God. Let the Word of Christ dwell richly in you. And then 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Why the Word of God? Because 2 Timothy 16, 17 says, all scripture. What scripture? All. What is all? All. Genesis to Revelation. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Notice that, profitable, beneficial for doctrine. That's what we've learned last week. Teaching for reproof, for a correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped. For every good work. You feel like you're incomplete or lacking? You need to spend time with this. The Word of God. This is how God saves and establishes us. Sustains and strengthens us by His Word. And remember, Jesus is the Word made flesh. That's why back in our text in verse 25, what does it say again? Now to Him who is able to establish you by my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ. Christ, the preaching of Jesus Christ, that is the preaching of His name, the preaching of the person. Listen, Christianity is not merely about words and teachings and commands. It's primarily about a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It is God in the person of Christ. 
we preach and teach nothing else but the Word of God, and we proclaim no one else but Jesus, no other name but the name of Jesus. Because it is in Christ Jesus that we, the church, have been firmly rooted and being built and established in the faith, as Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7 says. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so we walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. What this is saying is that we are complete in Christ. Every, everything we need for life and godliness, God has given us in Christ, as 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 declares. I mean, if God did not spare His only begotten Son, but gave Him up for us all, will He not also along with Him graciously give us all things? Remember, that's Romans chapter 8, verse 32. So that in Christ, we are able to live life in this world, established, strengthened, as Philippians chapter 4, 13 says what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As a matter of fact, according to Romans chapter 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. And that is why we preach Christ. We don't preach our beloved pastor. We don't advertise our beloved pastor and beloved religious ministers. No, we preach Christ because all we need is Christ and that's who we proclaim. And we put our confidence and dependence in Christ. That's why Jesus said, follow me. The only time we follow people is when these people are following Christ. Just like what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus, He is enough. He is sufficient because Jesus is God in bodily form and we are complete in Him. Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. For in Him, that is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. And that's why we preach Christ and Him crucified. What a profound yet wonderful truth. God in the flesh, God in bodily form, and suffered and died on the cross, which is what the gospel message is. What a mystery. God became a man. And those who believe in Him are saved and becomes part of the body of Christ, which is the church, which is another mystery. Which is what our text is referring to, back to verse 25, where it says, according to the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, and then in verse 26, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the confirmed, by the command of the eternal God so that all nations might believe and obey Him. And as we just read, the word mystery does not mean something that is unknowable or inexplicable or something hard to understand or explain but rather it is something that is previously hidden or concealed, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings, which is the scriptures, the Bible, and made known by the command of God. In other words, God wanted the mystery con contained in His Word, even the gospel, God wanted it made known. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned and God meted out the consequences of their sin? And to Eve, he said that not only will she have labor pains, but out of the woman will come the seed. Her seed will bruise Satan's head. And nobody truly understood that. There was a concealment. And that's the beginning of the gospel message, the proclamation. And all throughout the calling of Abraham that people didn't know why Abraham was called. They thought it was just to create a nation. But to continue to develop that and, and fulfill that promise, the prophecy that was given by God to Eve. And then in the New Testament beginning from Matthew, that's why it begins with all this, this uh, what you call that lineage in chapter 1 to show to us the truth of the gospel that was concealed is now revealed. 
in Christ Jesus. And the mystery is Christ himself. God became a man so that he can pay for our sins through his death on a cross. And through faith in him, the church was born. Again, a mystery in itself. The church being made up both Jews and Gentiles. The mystery of the gospel is, is Christ and his church. As Ephesians 5.32 says, the mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. The mystery is the gospel message that declares and demonstrates the power of God. As Ephesians 6.19 says, And also for me that works may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. The message was concealed, but it's now revealed. Look at these other verses in Colossians 1. 26 to 28, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16. Read it all together now. Go. Without controversy, the great mystery. How a person can truly be godly. God became man. Justified in the spirit, seen by the angels, preach among the Gentiles, believe in the world, and received up in glory. And then Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you, that this, that is, the mystery made known to me by revelation, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been received, revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. And you can read from verse 7 to verse 11 as Paul continues to explain this mystery of Christ and the church. And so this gospel message, who is Jesus Christ, is proclaimed and revealed by the command of the eternal God. Eternal, which means that He is the God who knows the past, present, and future, yet He Himself has no beginning and no end. God wanted sinners, the whole world for that matter, to know the good news of salvation in Christ Jesus, so that, so that what? Back to our verse. So that all nations might believe and obey Him. So that all nations, no one excluded, might believe and come to obedience. That is obedience that comes from faith, from believing Christ, who He is. He is Lord. Obedience is the result of truly believing and trusting in God. True faith in Christ is demonstrated in obedience to His Word. Not by following rituals and rules and traditions, but obedience to the Word of God. That's what true saving faith does. It makes the sinner surrender to God and submit to His Word. So that the sinner no longer lives in rebellion to God, but in submission to God's will, which is good and pleasing and complete. Who would have come up with such a powerful and well thought of, intelligent, effective plan of salvation? Who would have come up with that? God and God alone, who alone is wise. Only God is wise. None of us. And that's why if we want wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom that is true and pure, 
We need to come before God and ask Him wisdom. Not only for our personal lives, but in our relational lives. As husband and wife, in the family, your friends. We need to seek the wisdom. What does God say? And not only what does God say, but depend on Him for the strength that He gives us. And the strength that He gives us is not emotion. So that when we wake up and I feel like, yeah, I feel strong and energetic. I'm going to obey the Lord and live for Him. But then the following day we wake up and we're like, I am not in the mood. And then we don't obey and follow the Lord. No, it's not dependent on emotion. It's dependent on who God is and the faithfulness and the truthfulness of His Word. And that's where we come in where we just have to what? Surrender and submit for we acknowledge God is our God and we are His servants. Only God could have come up with this for only God is wise. And that's how this doxology ends. Back to verse 27. To the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. Why through Jesus Christ? Because He and He alone is the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. Even as we go to God in prayer, in worship, in praise and adoration, we are, we are able to do it only through Christ. Without Jesus, there is no way for anyone to reach God. There is no other way but Jesus. Even as children of God, we come to the presence of God by Christ. We don't just come boldly because, you know, now I'm a child of God and I can just do whatever I want. No. It's all by the recognition and acknowledgement of Christ, who He is and what He has done for us. So that even now as God's children, we can come to the very presence of God with full confidence that is boldly, with boldness, because Jesus Christ because of Jesus Christ and what He has accomplished on the cross, shedding His own precious blood, as Hebrews chapter 9, verse 19 to 22 declares, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is His body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, which is the Word. Notice, it's addressed to Christians. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, let us enter boldly. No. It says what? Most holy place how? By the blood of Jesus. Don't be so confident that you can just enter the presence of God because of who you are. But it's because of the blood of Jesus, His death on the cross. And if Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did not become man, there would be no Savior. But God in His wisdom and power planned in eternity past the only way of salvation for sinners. And that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. And this life is in His Son, and he who has the Son is life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. That, my friend, is the gospel message. Jesus Christ became man to save you and I from sin. Jesus Christ did not become man so that He can deliver you and I from financial meltdown, to solve our financial problems. To heal our every sickness. No, that's not why Jesus Christ came. He became a man so that he can die for your sin and my sin and the sin of the whole world. And yet, that's not what we hear in many a so called Christian, evangelical, Protestant churches, mega churches at that, who say that Jesus Christ, and as long as you have faith in him, you can live the best life now. And be a better version of yourself. Which is what Joel Austin is so fond of doing. I'm just I'm repeating what the message said last week. You got to know what a true teaching and what a true gospel is. What a false is. 
Because if you believe in the wrong gospel, there is no salvation in there. A gospel that says, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, but I also believe I have to pray to, and then they name the person, whether it's a saint, whether it's an apostle, whether it's his mother, whether it's whoever. There is no salvation in such a gospel. It's a false gospel. The gospel is Jesus Christ died for your sin. That's why he came. Do you have Jesus Christ in your heart? Ruling and reigning as Lord? If not, you're still in your sins because only Jesus can forgive you. Not by your going to church and being sincere at that. As if you're contributing to your salvation. No, Jesus is the Savior. Not you and not anyone else. Not a church. Not any rule. But Christ. If you are still in your sins, you are still separated from God because the payment or the punishment for sin is death, which is separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. But you need to receive the gift. And you can only receive it by faith that is trusting and believing in what God said, that Jesus is the only way. And so you need to pray to Him and call on the name of the Lord Jesus and ask for His forgiveness. Tell Him that you want Him, that you need Him. Tell the Jesus that you believe in Him in your heart and that you are receiving Him in your life, that you want to follow Him as your Lord. And when you pray to Him, listen, He will answer you. He will answer your prayer of faith. He will save, and save you and strengthen you that is established you. If you've made the decision to believe and follow Jesus Christ, let me know so you can be what? Identified in His name. That is baptism, even as I welcome you to the family of God. And together, let us praise God. Let us praise God and let us give Him all the glory for who He is. Our God is able, able to save and establish us. And His salvation, again, is in the gospel message, which is the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who became man so that He can take our place and pay for our sins through His death on the cross. That is the wisdom of God and only God is wise. And we give Him the glory, all the glory, through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you now. And we give you now all the praise and the glory. Thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. That in Him, by your grace and faith, we are saved. And by the power of your word, we are established and strengthened not only individually, but even as a church. Oh Lord, may we continue in your word as we continue to live our lives here in this world and use us to tell others that you are the God who is able to save and to establish a sinner in Christ Jesus. And so Lord God, we give you all the praise even now as we continue to honor and worship you through our tithes and offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so